Hello again, my friends. I'm going to talk to you today about a pivotal issue in my journey. And it's one that I think a lot of women uh, fall um, prey to, if you want to use those terms. And that's fear. And fear is a stronghold that the devil loves to set up in us. And all he has to do is move all the players into place and set up circumstances that make us feel like we are alone or um, we don't have any resources to take care of our needs. And this leads us to believe that no one, not even God, is there to protect us. Protection is one of the core issues, one of the core needs, the basic needs that we have when we come into the world. We need protection. That's why we have a mother and father or we we're born into a family or we're adopted into a family or fostered um, is for this aspect of protection. So when we feel like that there's no one there to protect us and God is not there to protect us, we either go crazy or we try to protect ourselves. Now, I could go couldn't go crazy, you know, because I had already determined that I never wanted to have an emotional illness like I'd seen exhibited in my mother. This left me believing I had to protect myself. Now, I want to stop here and just say that I'm going to share some details about when I was sexually abused as a child. And I'm just saying that in case you have kids listening, this is a very PG rated uh, podcast, but it may foster discussion on this topic. And it's actually a conversation you should have with your kids so they feel free to come to you if they feel uncomfortable around any adults or even any other children, especially older children who might overpower or outwit them. So, you know, these issues are rampant in this day and age. When I was 11, it wasn't anything that I had really understood or uh, really, uh, I guess my, my parents had talked to me about this issue before, but it didn't seem to, you know, wasn't something that I heard a lot about from my friends or anything like that. So I didn't think it was any big deal. You know, but as an adult, when I realized that I had developed a stronghold of self-protection, I knew exactly where it came from. It stemmed from an incident when I was 11 and I was molested by a family friend. Now I'm going to call him Fred because it was, he was, he was a friend of the family. That's not his real name. I just want to let you know that. But I was at the place I considered the safest place in the entire world. And that was in my grandparents' two-story farmhouse. So Fred and his wife, Minnie, were visiting from out of state. And Minnie was my grandma's best friend in the whole world. And of course, grandma was my person. Yeah, I didn't feel like I could ever be without my grandma. So grandma was really important in my life. And even though Fred and Minnie lived far away, they wrote, Grandma and Minnie wrote every week and they told each other everything because she would read Minnie's letters to me and she would even read her letters and that before she sent them, she'd read them to me, what she was writing to Minnie. So the highlight of Grandma's week was definitely hearing from Minnie. So they didn't come every year, but when they did come, our extended family got together as often as possible, basically to hear Fred talk because he liked to tell tall, tell tall tales. You know, some of them were true. Some of them were out and out lies, but who cared? You know, he was entertainment. He was loud and he was boisterous and he was the life of the party. But from the minute he arrived, not only was he telling stories, but he was pulling silver dollars out of all of the, especially the little girl's ears. This was in exchange for sitting on his lap and giving him kisses. And us girls would line up for that. Well, actually, 
he would tell us to line up. So there was really no, uh, nobody was left out. Nobody, you couldn't even not be in the line. Okay. You had to have, you had to do it at least, at least once. Now the boys got silver dollars and quarters too, but I don't remember what they had to do for them. So when the silver dollars ran out with the girls, he'd start pulling out quarters for the same kisses. I distinctly remember having to kiss Fred for my silver dollars. His face was scratchy, need to be shaved. His lips were big and engulfing. And it was nothing like sweetly kissing Papa or dad on the cheek. I didn't like kissing Fred, but I endured it for the silver dollars because they were a big deal, especially back when I was 11. So it had been several years since they had come, but I noticed Fred was insisting more than ever before that I sit on his lap for kisses and silver dollars. He was also hugging me where his hands were straying to parts of my body that my mom told me I should never allow any boy to touch. And I thought maybe I was just, you know, maybe that was just my imagination. And, but I still, I left uh, where he was and I went inside to help grandma. Yeah, I was staying there that night. And that was because I was going to help her with getting everything ready for the next day, which was Sunday. And everybody was coming back for, for lunch after church. So grandma's house had two stories. Upstairs were three bedrooms. Downstairs was the main living room and Papa and, uh, you know, living, dining, kitchen, all that stuff. And Grandma and Papa's bedroom was, and then the only bathroom in the house was downstairs. Now, I usually slept on the couch or on a pallet down beside Grandma's when I stayed at their house because I was afraid of Boo, the ghost I thought lived upstairs. But since Fred and Minnie were sleeping upstairs, Grandma insisted that I shouldn't be afraid to sleep up there. So I chose the room at the top of the stairs. It was right above Mama and Grandma and Papa's room um, that was downstairs. And it was summer, windows were all open. I could hear Papa pray with Grandma before I fell asleep. All was right with the world. I had no inkling of what was gonna happen in the next morning. The sun had come up when I heard the door to my room open. I opened my eyes briefly and saw him enter the room and I quickly shut my eyes again, willing them to stay close and tried to pretend I was asleep. I, so I knew it was Fred who had walked into my room and I began praying silently for God to make him leave, but he was still there. I could hear his footsteps as he walked up to the side of my bed I didn't know a lot about what things boys do to girls and nothing about what older men might do to girls. And I knew if he had good intentions, though he would have thrown the door open and announced his interest, entrance, you know, because that was his, that was his style, right? He was loud and boisterous. Instead, he was sneaking in carefully, closing the door behind him, and he walked over to the bed and whispered, wake up, time to get up, and give your old Fred a kiss. He, he leaned like his entire body over the bed and gave me a quit, a kiss that I was sure would, would bruise my lips. And I still pretended to be asleep. During this whole time, I pretended to be asleep. But he yanked back the sheet. I could feel that morning breeze on my skin. I was well aware that my baby doll nightgown covered very little. I could also feel his eyes taking in every inch of the picture in front of him. You know, I remember him rubbing my leg and saying, come on now, I know you're awake. You can't fool me. But I couldn't have responded even if I wanted to, friends. I was paralyzed, just like the time that Grandma and I saw a copperhead snake on the trail down by the creek, and she told me to stand still and not move. I was well aware 
there was danger staring right at me, but I did not want to give him the satisfaction of me seeing him. Instead, I kept my eyes tightly shut, held my breath, and over and over again in my mind, I prayed, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. Every second of the next few minutes were etched in my memory. His hands moved from my legs to places. I knew mom would be angry if she knew he had touched it, touched there, but what could I do? He was a grown man. I was just like a fly on the wall compared to him. I wanted to scream as his hands lifted my nightgown to my chin and began other explorations. And the touching became groping and it hurt my body and my soul, frozen in time and space. My mind went numb. My body went limp. I wanted to be anywhere but there. I tried to go elsewhere in my mind and think good thoughts, but I could only think of how I could get away from him. I was so afraid of what he might do. He stopped for a moment and I heard him take off his shirt and then fiddle with something, maybe a zipper, I don't know. And after a cuss word left his lips, he continued his exploration. It felt like my mind just left my body. He jerked me like he was trying to wake me up. When I refused to open my eyes, he said in a hoarse whisper, I said, open your eyes or else. I mean, what could be worse than this? What could be the or else? I tried again to pray silently and urgently. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. But he was still there, and I wasn't sure I could endure anything else. I thought of, about, again, about what I could do to stop him. I could claw his face. I could kick him. I could scream at the top of my lungs. I saw every action in my mind, but I could not make my body move. And then, then I heard my answer to prayer. Fred, time for breakfast. And it was Minnie calling from the bottom of the stairs, just outside the room we were in. Be right there, sugar, he answered. And I could hear him moving, grabbing his shirt from where he had thrown it on the floor. But he leaned down close to me and said gruffly in my ear, once again, open your eyes. I disobeyed. I dared not move. I heard the door close. And even then, it was several minutes before I could allow myself to open my eyes. And the fear of him was still very present in the room. I didn't know if he would eat his breakfast quickly and come back, but it motivated me to get up, get my clothes on, go downstairs to the bathroom. And I could hear laughter coming from the kitchen, so I knew he was down there entertaining everyone. I locked the bathroom door and took a quick bath. I just wanted to wash him off of me. I had no idea it would be years before that would really happen. It wouldn't be me who set me free from those memories. It would be the God who heard me and answered my prayers that day. Now, although I wanted to tell Grandma what happened, I couldn't. Minnie was her best friend. What if Grandma didn't believe me? What if she thought it was all my fault? Was it my fault? I didn't know. Fred went to church every Sunday. He was supposed to be a good, upstanding man. Maybe it was my fault because, you know, Dad always told me not to wear shorts or sleeveless, sleeveless tops. It was summer, and I had worn both. Maybe it was my fault. Maybe I enticed him. I couldn't tell Dad, tell Dad what happened because he'd think it was my fault. And I couldn't tell Mom. I mean, she had enough 
problems dealing with everything she was going through personally. I decided I would have to protect myself. That was my only option. First, I decided I wouldn't stay at Grandma's while Minnie and Fred were there. If I had to go to an event where he was, family gathering or whatever, I would stay far away from him, even if it had, it would mean like being rude, you know? And several times it was, I was rude, but I didn't care. You know, it was harder than I thought to hide this and to, uh, you know, stay away from him because there were times that mom forced me to kiss Fred, even though I refused. I allowed it, but then I quickly pulled away and only because other adults were right there. But when I did that, Fred gave me a look that made me want to scream. I prayed he wouldn't ever come back to visit. And to tell you the truth, if he did, it was when I was older and was able to make excuses to stay away. Carrying the weight of what happened that day was overwhelming to me. I told no one until Brian and I decided to get married when I was 23. And I only told him because I didn't know how the Fred issue would affect my relationship with Roy. So I told him before we got married and he listened, he held me close and he told me he would protect me. Well, that's what I needed to hear right then. And it was a perfect solution whenever he was with me, but he couldn't be with me all the time. And when he wasn't there, the fear would come back. So about two years after Roy and I were married, I was working for a denominational headquarters. And my boss had told me during a performance review that he loved my work, he should. I was working 60 hours a week for a 40 hour week salaried job. However, he said I should lose weight and get nicer clothes. Now, I was angry that we'd call that fat shaming today. And I probably weighed about 260 pounds at that time. So I needed to lose about a hundred pounds. And I found out that my pastor's wife had gone on and a program of some kind and she had lost weight. So she and I had talked and told me about it and promised to help me on the journey. So I justified, you know, putting all of that expensive program on a credit card because it would be saving my job. Now it took a lot of hard work, but in about nine months, I lost at a hundred pounds. And that day I weighed by my scales and I had reached that magic number but I wanted to go to the program's office to officially weigh. So at lunch, I went and, and I weighed. And sure enough, I had done it. I had lost 100 pounds. I drove back to the office on cloud nine. I walked into the building, got on the elevator with one of the department directors. Now, I knew his name, but he traveled a lot and I hadn't talked with him before. So as soon as the elevator doors closed, he looked me up and down and said, you're looking really good today. Now, I was immediately back on the trail with the copperhead snake staring me in the face. And again, I froze and I didn't know what to say. He kept talking and he said something like, we'll have to get together sometime. And as soon as the elevator doors opened, I ran to my office. I had interpreted his actions as an older man coming on to me, much like Fred. And I realized my, my fear of certain types of men was still very much alive. So on that day, I made a willful plan to start eating sugar again. And I went to the break room. I bought two candy bars and a diet soda. Hadn't had either of those in over nine months, but it was a habit. I went right back to it. I felt like I had to protect myself. I thought if I hadn't lost weight, the department director wouldn't have come on to me. If I didn't look good, I wouldn't have enticed him. And that extra pounds could be my protection 
against men who are like copperhead snakes in this world. This stronghold of fear had really become entrenched in me. I knew it was crazy. I knew the department director might not have been coming on to me. I just thought he was. Other people have said, yeah, he probably was. I don't know. But the 11 year old me who was molested believed I was in danger. And I didn't understand how I could be an intelligent adult woman and still believe the, this lie that God wouldn't protect me, but I did. And it was such a stronghold that even when I forgave Fred during a Joyce Meyer com conference, it did not erase my need to self-protect. <clears throat> now, forgiving Fred was a first step in breaking the stronghold that said I must protect myself. Whenever I would think about Fred, you know, up to that point, I would see him as a huge monster in my mind, and I was a teeny tiny little wimp. But when I forgave him, I saw him as a shriveled up little old man compared to me, and I could take him on easily. But, see, when I forgave Fred, I was a super morbidly obese woman weighing 430 pounds. And so I saw him as a shrimp compared to me. And I reasoned that allowing myself to gain weight was working to self-protect me. God had torn down my fear of men, but the stronghold of I have to self-protect was still there. Then a few years later, I went through a course called Family of Origin, and uh, that was with Russ, my mentor, was the leader. And there was a woman who was a sexual abuse counselor who was also taking the course. So when I presented my family of origin, I talked about the molestation with Fred because it happened at my grandmother's house. And Russ answered, um, well, he asked the sexual abuse counselor a question. And I think that was mainly so I could hear the answer, right? And he, he asked her, what do you call a man who sexually abuses children? And she said, a pedophile. And he asked, does a pedophile just have one victim? She says, no, he has multiple victims. And he asked, so does he grab them off the street or how does he find his victims? And she answered, most of the time, they are very good at grooming victims, which means they entice them with candy or gifts. And they usually are outgoing people everyone loves and no one would suspect what they're doing. So then it was my turn. I asked her, so might they give kids money? She said, oh, yes, especially if the kids are motivated by money. They are good at reading what kids want. And then I said, ask her, how many kids might they abuse? And she said, as many as they can. And I said, so it wasn't my fault. And this time, both of them, both Russ and the the counselor answered in unison, it wasn't your fault. And it felt so good I could have cried that it wasn't my fault was what I needed to know. When we are children, we make decisions based on what we know at the time. When I was 11, I knew nothing about what Fred's problem was. I was an adult with children of my own before I discovered what a pedophile even was. Fred planned his adventure with me. He groomed me and chose me because he knew my home situation. I also happened to be in his target age range. Knowing this helped me understand the situation a lot better. It wasn't my fault. This was the logical truth I needed. I also needed to embrace the spiritual truth that God is with me, that he is my protector. Understanding this began to release more freedom into my life. I mean, Jesus had already set me free. Now I had to learn how to live in this newfound freedom. Self-protection was no longer necessary. God had removed my need to be constantly on guard. And I finally began to 
trust him to be my protector. When I began to look for them, I found many promises that reinforced my understanding of God as my protector. Probably the most helpful to me um, is in Psalm 91, some of the most helpful verses. Um, Psalms 4 through 6 in the New Living Translation says this, He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors by night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. And then verses 9 through 12 in, in Psalm 91. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you, no plague will come near your house, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. How could I be afraid when I have a faithful God who protects me with his promises and sends his angels to protect me? These days, I am constantly aware of God's presence with me in the form of the Holy Spirit. But I have also been aware many times of his angels protecting me, especially one time when my little Honda Fit bounced off of a semi twice on the interstate and the car was totaled. I only had a bruise where the seatbelt went across my shoulder. When I finally pulled over to the side of the road, my first wor words were, God, you must still have something left for me here on this earth to do because I should be dead right now. Roy took me to see the car once it had been towed to the junkyard. Major crunches were all on the driver's side. One was behind the driver's door and one was in front of it. The only place without a huge dent was the door right by where I was sitting. My angel had been standing right there protecting me. Even before the accident, I had finally accepted this full and told truth that God and God alone is my protector. The accident and the fact I walked away from it sealed it in me. I self-protected out of fear. Now, God talks a lot in the scriptures about fear and how we should not be afraid because he is with us and his will protect us with his strength. So we must like, um, get these truths down deep into our being so that we will trust that God will protect us. So Psalm, I mean, and let me let me just say this before I share some scriptures. He is going to protect us, but it may not be exactly the way we want it to be him to protect us. With Fred, he protected me, but he didn't immediately get him out of the room. He didn't protect me from from being, you know, um, subject to Fred doing what he did. But he did protect me from him going any further with what he was doing. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 2 Samuel 22, 3-4, My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And then down to verse 8, he adds, it is the Lord who goes before you he will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. 
Psalm 32, 7, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Romans 8, 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Hebrews 13, 6, we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Psalm 3, 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. Proverbs uh, 29, 25, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And last one, 1 John 4, 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Friends, it's the best feeling in the whole world to not live in fear. God is my protector. I don't have to self-protect. He will lead me where he wants me to grow, go, and I trust him. Sweet grace for your journey. I'll talk to you next week.